are y'all today? Good. Yes. You're looking forward to next week and our 20th anniversary and our potluck. I know uh, Matt told me to tell you that he's very hungry. I don't think that's a slide on Amy, though. I think, you know, he's just looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, she'll get me back for that. That's okay. Uh, today we're going to be talking about everyone's favorite topic. I mean, every, you, I know you just can't wait to talk about this, right? Aren't you glad you came today? Just mentioning that word, just saying the word sin, it can bring up so many emotions. Some of you probably maybe felt a little guilt, maybe somebody, maybe a little bit of fear, probably somebody at least rolled their eyes in their mind, oh, we're talking about this again kind of thing, right? But the Bible talks a lot about sin. And so Christians who care about following Jesus and who care about obeying his word should understand what sin is. And if you're here today, if you're listening online, you're not a Christian, maybe some of the things that we are talking about today will help you get a better understanding of what this one part of Christianity is about and maybe get a under better understanding about God as well. So today we're going to be talking through some common misconceptions about sin about how it's handled in our lives and how it affects our lives and others, and others' lives, too. So before we do that, we need to know exactly what we're talking about. So we're going to get into a definition about what sin is. Now, I've heard, and I've even, uh, me included, I've heard many people say that, give this definition of sin, that it means to miss the mark. You've probably heard that. Um, we miss, we fall short of like a bullseye kind of thing. You think of kind of like that. And how we came to this is that the English word sin originates from an archery term that means to miss the mark. But when I hear miss the mark, I always think of these guys, right? If you watch Star these, these guys, they can't hit anything, you know? So, but it's a good definition. It's easy to remember, you know, but this morning, let's dig a little, little deeper about what sin is. So in the Bible, sin is described as transgression of the law of God and rebellion against God. Now, transgression is not one of those words that we use very often. You don't hear it on the streets. You don't throw it around with your friends. So it's, kind of, it's what I call like a churchy word, right? About the only time you hear the word transgression is in church. But what it means is an act that goes against a law, a rule, or a code of conduct. It's an offense. So as we look at the very first sin, the very first sin we see this rebellion. Now, a lot of times when we think about the first sin, we think of Adam and Eve, right? But if you think about it, sin began with Lucifer. And if you're not familiar with the Bible, Lucifer, who he was, he was probably one of the most beautiful and powerful angels. But he was not content with his position. He wanted a position to be higher than God. And that was the beginning of his downfall. That's when he fell. And so you could read about that in Isaiah chapter 14. And so today... What was Lucifer, now we call Satan. And he brought sin to the human race in the Garden of Eden. Did you think about this? Satan tempted Adam and Eve with something very similar to what he desired. He said, you, will sh you shall be like God. So it's always about being like God or above God. We see this today. And Satan still desires to be above God. If you look in Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, he's talking to, um, when Jesus is being tempted, he says, it says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he says to Jesus, if you will bow down and worship me. Satan was and still is trying to be in a position higher than God. And so many times... It's our selfishness. It's us believing that we, what we want is better than what God wants for us. And that becomes one of our strongest downfalls. So what are some of the misconceptions about sin that we need to address? Well, the first one is this, that sin's consequences can be managed. That you can manage the consequences of your sin. This is a lie. This is a lie that Satan tells us, and it's a lie that we tell ourselves every time we want to indulge in sin. 
you think, hey, it's, just, it'll no, it's no big deal, that you can manage it, no one will know. But the truth is that sin is always bigger than we can manage. It's like trying to juggle a bowling ball, uh, a machete, and a chainsaw that, that's running, right? And you've never tried to juggle before, right? That's, that's not going to turn out well. You know, you think about that. It's why we are so often told that we should run away from our temptations. 2 Timothy 2.22 says this. Paul is writing to his friend Timothy, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from, from a pure heart. The Message Bible says it this way. Run away. Run away from childish indulgence. Now, it doesn't mean like the indulgence that you had when you were like five. It means like an immaturity, an immature indulgence. Run after mature righteousness, faith, love, peace, joining those who are in honest and serious prayer before God. Don't play around with it. Don't coddle it, right? You don't walk up to a tiger thinking you're going to pet it and think you're going to come back with both your hands, right? Don't do that. The truth is many of us, have at least that one thing, at least that one sin that can easily take us over. And nobody really wakes up and says one day, you know, I just, I want to ruin my life. I want to destroy my family. I want to wreck my career. I don't want to hurt the church. But what happens is that we silence that whisper. I call that the Holy Spirit nudge urging us to run away from sin. And instead, we listen to the voice of the enemy, assuring us that it's going to be okay, that no one will know. But here's the problem. Even if you've kept the sin secret for a while, you know, and you are someone, and you matter. We cannot game plan the consequences of sin. We can't plot out the impact on our family and our friends We cannot foresee the way that people will react that we hurt. So don't believe the lie that you can manage the consequences of sin. If you know that a situation like staying up late, being home by yourself, hanging out with certain people, if you know that usually has an influence when it comes to a particular sin, run away, right? Run away. Don't hang around. Do something different. You need to do this. You need to plan ahead. You know that you're going to be home by yourself. Go to the library. Go to a park. Go do something, right? And then pray ahead. Don't wait until you're tempted to start praying. Now, you should start praying when you're tempted, but don't wait. Start praying. Pray that morning. Lord, I know that I'm going to be by myself today. Lord, help me to have the strength to go find something else to do. And then get run. If you want to stay up late, don't do it. Be real with yourself. Be honest with yourself. Find new friends if the people that you're hanging around with now cause you to stumble. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, that's whatever you need to do. But when Jesus was talking about If you remember, he talks about plucking out an eye or cutting off a hand that causes you to sin. You know, he wasn't being literal. This is what he means. He's like, do whatever it takes to run away from your sin. You cannot control the outcome or the impact. And that leads to our second misconception, that sin is always individual and that's never social. When you read the New Testament... You'll notice that most of the imperatives given about fighting sin and temptation are not given to a single person, but they're given to a people. Jesus said to pray this. He said, lead us not into temptation. It's true that individuals will stand accountable before God for his or her sin, but, don't, but we don't sin in isolation. We sin in community. To sin is to sin against both Christ and to sin against his body of believers. And while the Bible describes the corruption of sin as individual, it also describes it as social. 
And while every believer must engage in personal repentance, God often judges nations and societies. Look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, this is Jesus. The city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how often I have wanted to gather your, ch your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings. But you wouldn't let me. And now, look, your house is abandoned and desolate. So consider how Jesus just rebuked the nation of Israel for its unwillingness to embrace him. And when you look at the book of Revelation, and he's, he's talking to the churches in Revelation, and he's, he's talking to them and rebuking, he's rebuked them as whole bodies for their various sins. So in the Bible, we see urges of both personal and corporate repentance. So if societies and communities are made up of sinners, it would follow that at times they can be tainted, that they can be corrupted and complicit in sin against God. I was talking to someone this week, this week about how many stories have come up just in the last, what, five or ten years about pastors that have fallen, that have, they, they needed to resign or they were fired because of some sin in their life. It did not just affect them. It affected their whole congregation. It affects the whole church as a, the capital C, the church, the church of the world. Because sometimes we have to kind of rise up from that reputation that happens because the people in the world who don't come to church are not Christians. They're, the only thing that they see, they, they see the headlines, right? Oh, this, this person, oh, look, it's another hypocrite. So we have to be careful. It affects the body of believers. It's important to understand that when you sin, the impact can be felt about those around you, especially those who are closest to you. Even if you think that you've kept the sin a secret. Because sin makes you different. It makes you act differently towards people. You might not realize it. Maybe you're more depressed than you, than you should be or than you normally are. More anxious. Maybe you, you have a little bit more, um, maybe you're not quite as patient with your spouse because you got this sin weighing down on your shoulders. And if that sin has been hanging around a long time, you are probably in a, get ready for a fight, right? And that leads us to our third misconception. Sinful behaviors and patterns can be overcome overnight. That is a misconception. Because notice the words behaviors and patterns. You can also think of addictions, or habits, sin habits. These are the sins that have dug down deep with their claws because of choices that you made over and over and over again throughout your life. But the good news, there is good news. The good news about sin is that Christ has conquered it and he has no power over us. In Romans chapter 6, verse 6, it says this, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. See, without Christ, we are hopelessly enslaved to the patterns of sin. Now, we can modify our behavior with self-control, but we cannot fix it at the heart level. We talked about this just a few weeks ago. True change comes when the Holy Spirit is working on us and with us and through us from the inside out. We have the ability to fight sin and win because the same power that lifted Jesus up out of the grave is the same power that works through us from the inside out. We have the ability to fight sin and win because we have the Holy Spirit living in us. Now, sometimes Christians think that upon salvation, deep and destructive patterns will automatically go away. But if you've ever worked with someone or known someone who's fighting an addiction, you know that 99% of the time that is not true. Now, I've seen, I know people who have had these miraculous breakthroughs, and they do happen. We have to remember, you need to remember that's not the norm if you were struggling this morning. 
and you're just like, why can't I break this? That's not the norm. But keep going. The process of sanctification is when God guides us, guides us to maturity, and he's rooting out the embedded patterns and the habits of unrighteousness. And sometimes it takes a lifetime. So if you're still fighting, you don't give up. Don't give in. Don't be a discouraged. If you fall, what do you do? You knock the dust off, right? Knock the dust off. And then you lean into Jesus. Lean into Jesus. That's, that he's there for you. Don't run away from him. You lean into him. And remember that we are eternal beings. This place on earth, we're, not, we're just here for a short time. If you really think about it, you know, 90 years, whatever. That was a very short time when you compare it to eternity. And we are eternal beings. So if you're a Christian, you are a child of God that sins, that messes up. Remember, you are a child of God. That is your title. You are not a sinner. That's not your title anymore. Names matter. You are a child of the Heavenly Father. And so the fourth misconception is this. Sinful choices are a person's identity. Now, you can hardly watch a movie anymore, listen to a popular song without hearing the words, be true to yourself. We hear that a lot today. It's often used in reference to the way someone desires to live or a choice that goes against God's plan for human flourishing. But here's the deal. To sin is not to be true to ourselves. It's a distortion of God's original design. And sinning is not a natural human behavior. It's a corrupted human behavior. Christ died and he rose again to redeem humans from their enslavement to death. And as children of the Heavenly Father, we don't have to accept that our sins and sin patterns define us. And this is good news. Sin is not who you are. You are not the sum total of all your behaviors. You are a Christian. You are a redeemed image bearer of, from, of whom Christ is restoring to original glory, the God-glorifying, image-bearing purposes that he has for your life. So do not root your identity in your struggles and weakness. Jesus does not see you as that. He doesn't see you as a liar. He doesn't see you as a porn addict. He doesn't see you as an adulterer. He doesn't see you as an out-of-control angry person. Those are labels Satan gives you to keep you from dwelling on your new identity as a child of God. And if you're not a Christian this morning, these labels can keep you away from the salvation that Jesus has to offer you today. God cares more about you than you could ever possibly imagine. Think about how your mom cares for you. He cares for you more than that, right? Or your father, anybody that you think of right now that cares for you. It's unimaginable how much God cares for you and God loves you. No matter what you have done, he is here to offer you grace and forgiveness. And that leads us to the next misconception that speaking too much about the grace of God's forgiveness in Jesus will only encourage people to sin. Many people, when they read Romans 8.1, Paul says, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Many people believe that something like that will encourage people to sin. That if we strongly emphasize that forgiveness is available, then what keeps those who are in Christ from turning to immorality and sinful, sinful indulgence? Now, there are a few. There are a few that may use this truth to say, oh, all right, great, I get to sin because I get to walk up to Jesus and I can just ask for forgiveness. So I can just do whatever I want and I can come back and I can ask for, ask for forgiveness. But if, you know, but I would, if, 
those people, I would ask them to carefully examine their relationship with Jesus Christ. And think about that. What is the point? If you become saved and you want Jesus to save you from your sins, what is the point of walking back to your sins? There's no point in that. The truth of no condemnation should create such joy in our souls that our only thoughts are of how we can enjoy this God who has made salvation possible. We should have joy in our salvation. You see, living under constant condemnation can actually strengthen and solidify sin in your life. That pressure, that weight of feeling the shame and feeling the judgment, it all eventually just becomes unbearable. When we start living in despair of ever being free or ever feeling good about yourself, God doesn't want us walking around all hunched over. He wants us to experience joy. It is called the good news. The good news. So, if we walk around like that, then what happens is the sinning becomes more attractive. It becomes an outlet. It becomes an appealing escape and a way of easing the pressure on our souls. You think about it. We often sin because it's numbing our pain. It's an escape for something that's going on in our lives. You talk to an addict, and that's exactly where what they were trying to do. They were trying to escape something that happened, maybe even something in their childhood, or something that may be even happening right now. And so that's what sin is. It's an escape. But there... And there is little hope that you will make any progress in your battle with sin until you know that in spite of your sin, there is no condemnation for you. You and I will find the power and incentive to pursue obedience and a life of holiness only when we come to fully grasp what it means to say and believe no condemnation. Because of that is what it means to live in freedom from sin. Maybe you believe today that you can never live in that freedom, that you've gone too far. And that leads us to our last misconception is this, that some of my sin is so awful, so horrendous, that I can never be delivered from the condemnation that I deserve. This so often keeps people paralyzed spiritually. They live in daily fear that their sin is simply just too bad, too far gone, too frequent, that not even the God of grace and mercy can bring himself to forgive them. But remember, Paul declares that for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Because think, to be condemned by God means that you are liable to endure and suffer the eternal consequences of your sin. It means that you are heading to an eternity without God, hell, unless you repent and turn to faith in Jesus. To be condemned is to stand guilty before God clothed in your own righteousness. But the good news is to be justified means to stand boldly before God clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When you are in Jesus Christ, you have put your faith in him. And there is no valid reason why you should ever again experience fear or, or apprehension or, suspe- or suspicion about your relationship with God or where you're going to spend an eternity. This doesn't mean that you won't experience these things, but what it does mean that there is no valid reason why you should. Will you at times have doubt? Will you at times have anxiety rising up in your heart that maybe God is actually against you instead of for you? Yes, you probably will because Satan is always after you, always attacking. But you shouldn't. 
and you don't have to. And if you're not a Christian this morning, remember that there is no sin, there is nothing that you have done that Jesus dying on the cross cannot wash away clean. And you can have this freedom from sin that we have been talking about this morning. Amen. There are Christians, there are Christians here in this room that could tell you about the awful, awful things that they have done. But now they live in freedom from their sin. And so maybe you're asking yourself this morning, well, how can I experience that freedom? Maybe you've heard the word save be thrown around. What does that mean? I mean, you might even have questions. I don't understand. Why does it have to be this way? Well, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier this morning. We were talking about Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve eating the fruit from the tree that God told them not to eat from. And some of you might wonder, it's like, well, why did God put that tree there in the first place? That's a valid question. But it's because love and choice, love and choice, they go hand in hand. They're two sides of the same coin. Listen, I can tell my wife every day that I love her, and she probably likes to hear it. But if my actions do not show her love, if I choose to be with someone else, even though I have made her a promise that I will only be with her, I'm not really loving her. I made a choice. So I make a choice to love her. And so God gave Adam and Eve a choice, a choice to obey out of love. Because think about this, without choice, there is no love. No choice, we call that slavery. God wanted to love us, so he gave us choice. He gave us free will. And I've heard this yesterday. Somebody asked, why did he give us so much free will? It's because the reason he gave us as much free will as we have is because he wanted to give us that much love and be able to love others. But Adam and Eve chose rebellion. And that rebellion, it had consequences. Just like we talked earlier, they could not manage the consequences. And from, from that day, it brought sin into the world. And because of that decision, we were all born into sin and we were all born into a broken world. So because of our sin, we all deserve death. And while the physical consequence of sin is a physical death, that is not the only kind of death that results from sin. All sin is ultimately committed against an eternal and infinite God. And because of that, the just penalty for our sin is also eternal and infinite. What we need to be saved from is eternal destruction. And because of the just penalty for our sin is infinite and eternal, only God, who is infinite and eternal, could pay the penalty. But however, since God is divine in his nature, he can't die. So what did God do? God became a human being. He became Jesus. And he took on human flesh, and he lived among us, and he taught us, and walked among us. And when the people rejected him, and his message, he sought, they sought to kill him. But then he willing, willingly sacrificed himself for us, allowing himself to be crucified. And because Jesus Christ was human, he could die a human's death. But because Jesus Christ was God, his death had an eternal and infinite value. Jesus' death on the cross was the perfect and complete payment for our sin. He took the consequences that we deserve. Jesus' resurrection from the dead demonstrated that his death was indeed the perfectly sufficient sacrifice for sin. So what can you do to be saved? What can you do to experience this freedom that we've been talking about? In Acts 6.31 it says, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You see, God has done all the work. All you have to do is receive in faith the salvation that God offers. You fully trust in Jesus as the payment for your sins. God is offering you salvation as a gift. And all you have to do 
is accept it. All you have to do, repent from your sins and say, Lord, I believe that you paid the penalty for my sins on that cross, that you died for my sins and that you rose three days later and that you are the only way to salvation. Let's everybody stand. If that is you this morning, if that is you this morning, and you need that freedom that God is offering you from your sins, if you're like, I need that salvation, I don't know where to turn, well, God is here for you to turn to this morning. It's not a magic prayer, but I would like for you to pray that with me this morning, if that is you, if you may have made that decision today. Father God, Lord, I give my life to you, Lord. I know that I am nothing without you. So I just to give my life to you this morning, Lord. I repent of my sins. I turn to you as my Savior. And I accept that free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we're going to take a moment. We're going to sing another song together. The altar is open. If you would like to come up and pray, you can pray at your seat. But we're going to sing another song together this morning. And so I just invite you to come and pray to your heavenly Father this morning as we sing this song, this last song.